Okay, so we're going to look at the requirements in 110.16 arc flash hazard warnings as per the 2020 version of the National Electrical Code. Now, this requirement was introduced in the 2002 version, and for some uh, history on that regard, go check the other video out in regard to the 2002 version. Now, ever since its introduction, there's been a lot of battles going back and forth with regard to uh, <clears throat> what the language, uh, how it should read. And so uh, the original intent was an actual calories per centimeter squared. In 2002, we ended up with a flash protection, a, a hazard warning. In 2005, we had a very minor change, a couple minor changes. Well, one, one I guess, somewhat major change. They added meter socket enclosures in the 2005 version. And then they updated 70E to the 2004 version because it was updated. And then in the 2008 version, they just changed the language a little bit right in the beginning. They said equipment such as switchboards, panel boards, industrial control panels, as opposed to uh, exactly exactly those switchboards, panel boards, industrial control panels, and meter sockets. So changing the beginning of the text by saying electrical equipment such as switchboard, panel boards, industrial control panels, that sort of expands these requirements because now you're giving these as examples. So if I had a piece of electrical equipment that uh, was likely to require examination, adjustment, servicing, or maintenance while energized, I would still have to put that um, marking. I could argue that you still have to have a hazard uh, marking on there about an arc flash warning. Then in the 2011 code cycle, they basically changed, they, they changed the title from flash uh, protection because it's a label, it doesn't provide protection. So the debate during the 2011 cycle was, look, this, this label does not provide protection, it's simply raising awareness. So they changed the title of 110.16 to Arc Flash, not just Flash, it's Arc Flash Hazard Warning. Much more in line with exactly what this section is, is, ask, is looking for. And they added some clarity with regard to dwelling units, they added the word units, uh, and other than dwellings, and you know, so they made some changes there. Uh, and this is the cycle that went from fine print notes to informational notes. So 2011, we don't no longer had fine print notes. We moved into informational notes, and they updated the date of uh, 70E to the 2009 version. It went, in 2014, again, it got some more attention. They added switch gear. So it didn't have switch gear before. It had panel boards, switch boards, industrial control panels, but switch gear wasn't there. So switch gear was put in uh, and they left the equipment such as, you know, I mean, it, it, technically it already covered switch gear, but they wanted that clarity because obviously a debate occurred in the field. And this was the, the, the final uh, location. If you look at some of the history over the cycles, there were multiple public inputs and comments saying, look, it doesn't make sense that we do a field marking because in many cases, the manufacturer was putting a label about the arc flash hazard on this equipment when it left the factory. Physically putting another label on in the field didn't really accomplish anything. So uh, the, the code panel one finally recognized it should be field or factory marked. That just made life a little bit easier for everybody. Um, and then they put a reference in there to 110.21B, and if you're familiar with 110.21 is marking, and B is field applied hazard markings, and that's where it bring, you bring in some of the requirements, permanently legible, environmental conditions, all that great stuff is in that section. So they're saying, look, you gotta, you got to meet these requirements as well. Um, they updated the version of 70E to 2012. And uh, tweaked that informational note a little bit, saying it, it gives you guidance, such as determining severity of potential exposure, planned safe work practices, and they say arc flash labeling. So now we're getting that introduction that, okay, look, 70E can give you guidance on labeling arc flash because the debates were occurring still. Remember, the first, very first kickoff of this in the 2002 version was, I want calories per centimeter squared on this equipment. And they said, no, we're just going to give you a warning. And, and these debates were still going on about labeling incident energy in 110.16. And um, in, in this case here, the informational note is bringing to awareness again that, look, you can put arc flash labels on here. 
uh, that actually tell you what the calories are. And, uh, and that is, uh, a, you know, requirement requirements found in 70 E for the standard for electrical safety in the workplace. And then you've got the 17 code where they separated things out a little bit. Now you had two first level subdivisions. You had a general requirements and then you had service equipment. So now they have special requirements for the service. The requirements that are in A are basically the same language that you saw in the previous editions of the National Electrical Code regarding the electrical equipment such as switchboards, switchgear, panel boards, industrial panels, etc. That's your generic labeling. And then in B, they added a, this is all new, the in B service equipment, it says in other than dwelling units, in addition to the requirements in A, so that's that an A member just says, hey, there's an arc flash hazard here. They said a permanent label shall be field or factory applied to service equipment rated 1,200 amps or more. So here's a 1,200 amp number. And the label shall meet the requirements of 110.21B and contain the following information. You have to have the nominal system voltage. You have to have the, and this is the 17 version. You have to have the nominal system voltage, available fault current at the service overcurrent protective devices, the clearing time of service overcurrent protective device, and the date the label was applied. Now, this uh, requirement of, of the nominal voltage, etc., lines itself very well up with 70E, uh, basically the table method within 70E, where, and that's table 130.7, Charlie 15. Um, A and B, A is your AC systems, B is your DC systems. If you look at 130.7 Charlie 15A, you have uh, you have a, a, a table method that basically says, look, if you're not living in a labeled environment, meaning I don't know the calories per centimeter squared, how do I determine my personal protective equipment? I'm going to go into this table, and I'll just give you one example, a panel board that's a 600-volt panel board or 480-volt panel board. I would look in here, and it's the second row, and it says a panel boards or other equipment rated greater than 240 volts and up to 600 volts, so a 480 volt panel board would fall into this row. The parameters, maximum of a 25,000 amp available fault current. Look at one of the labels. I got voltage, so 240 to 600, that's option number one is, that you were, or requirement number one for the labeling is the nominal system voltage. That helps me with the tables. Available fault current. Remember in the tables, parameters, maximum of 25,000 amps of fault current. So that helps me understand whether or not I can use the table. If I'm over 25,000 amps, then I can't for this example. The clearing time of the service overcurrent protective device is based on the available fault current at the service equipment. That tells me if I look at, uh, continue on in, in 70E, parameters, after the fault current, it says a maximum of 0 0.03 seconds or two cycles, fault clearing time. So line item three helps me with my third parameter in this table to be able to effectively use a table method. And then the date. Uh, and that helps me, again, from a 70E perspective about, you know, condition, how, how valid are these numbers, et cetera. And, and 18 inches. So now I have what appears to be something that could help me with applying the table method within the 70E in this table, which we could argue every day of the week and twice on Sunday that you really, uh, that would be a misapplication of that table method because the clearing time of that service overcurrent protective device, it's it's the upstream overcurrent device that I need to do my clearing times. So that's part of the issues with 110.16B in this, uh, in this case. But suffice it to say, we've got it in the code now in the 17 cycle, and there is an exception that service equipment labeling should not be required if an arc flash label is applied in accordance with acceptable industry practices, which is your 70E labels, which is gonna reference back to IEEE 1584 and other standards to help you understand how to create a labeled environment that has the calories per centimeter squared. And they added a couple, uh, I believe there are some uh, informational notes as well. Uh, there's three informational notes, 70E, which they updated to the 2015 version, ANSI Z535, and they updated that version as well. And then they brought in uh, 70E, uh, the standard provides specific criteria for developing arc flash labels for equipment that provides nominal system voltage, incident energy levels, arc flash boundaries, minimum requirement, 
required levels of personal protective equipment and so forth. So they're adding some more clarity that 70E will help you develop those la labels. Now, that's the 17 code. Now, the 20 code, remember, this is other than dwelling units, all that jazz, but the this label is, there's some problems, right? So we know that I can't really use the table method. Putting the clearing time for those overcurrent protective devices, uh, for the main overcurrent protective device in that panel board doesn't really help the electrical worker establish personal protective equipment and all of that good stuff. So 110.16 in the in the 2020 code did not really change that much. Um, you've got A and B. Uh, a is still the general requirements. B has the nominal system voltages, and they put those references in. Uh, so the 17 code, between the 17 code and the 2020 code, uh, there was a lot of debate and a lot of arguing going on between these two, uh, between these two uh, time frames uh, with regard to the requirements that you find in, in 110.16. But uh, the changes were not significant. And I know I can tell you it's being debated again in the 2023 cycle. So right now, as it stands, and, and the other concern was the available fault current. You know, what, what is that available fault current? How am I going to calculate that? Is it a maximum? Is it a minimum? All that good stuff with regard to, uh, uh, with regard to the arc flash labels. So right now you have one or two different options that you can employ. You can put the system voltage and mark all of this and. And the other, the other issue that this raised was the number of disconnects. So if I have my service equipment, because this is service equipment, if, it has, if it's leveraging the six disconnect rule, now I have to put six different clearing times, one available fault current, but six different clearing times. And, and then there's barrier requirements that are going in in 406 at this time to address in the 17 code. And then in the 2020 code, they expanded the barriers, the line side barriers. And they were like, well... You know, we, we have a hazard here. I can't really effectively label it with a clearing time of six clear, six different clearing times. W what does it really help and who does it really help? So there's a lot of that debate going on with regard to this. But suffice it to say, for 110.16B, service equipment in other than dwelling units, I would highly recommend that you follow 70E and you label that service equipment with an incident energy value. And that incident energy value is going to be based upon the available fault current at that equipment and the clearing time of the upstream overcurrent protective device, which more than likely is a utility fuse. So service equipment is going to carry with it a very high incident energy number for that reason. Now, another recommendation I would have from a safety by design perspective is go down to a single overcurrent protective device. Check out the changes in 230 with regard to the six disconnect rule in the 2020 code. You're going to want to look at that and continuing forward in future revisions of those uh, of Article 230 with regard to service equipment because this change and the change we saw in the 17 code in 408 with regard to line side barriers on service equipment, raising awareness of the hazards of service equipment. So basically, those are the requirements in the 2020 National Electrical Code around 110.16, 110.16A and B. A is you got a hazard. B is more specific information around the severity of that hazard. Hopefully this helps. And uh, that's 110.16 for the 2020 version of the National Electrical Code.